Dr. Larson, thank you so much nice for coming in. You bet. And I always start this out very easy. Would you state your full name and date of birth? Uh, David L. Larson. I was uh, born uh, December 9th, 1943. I'm okay. 72 and a half years old. Okay. okay. And uh, would you tell us a little bit about the name of your parents and uh, any medical relationships uh, they might my, have had or how? I was actually the first physician in our family on both sides of our family. Uh, my dad and mom uh, uh, met and were married at, uh, in Kansas City, Missouri, which is where I was born. Okay. And my dad was at, uh, in World War II, and, uh, and uh, they were married for well over 50 years. What did he do? He was a ceramic engineer, which uh, he worked for uh, American Standard, which uh, makes plumbing fixtures. Mm -hmm. Like Kohler and that sort of thing. Uh, right. Those are that was there was their competition, and so my father uh, worked. Uh, he was a manager of a large uh, American Standard plant that was in New Orleans, Louisiana, which is where I was uh, raised. How many children, grandchildren, do you have? Sherry and I have got. Uh, we've been married 39 years, and uh, we have five and a half grandchildren. Our, okay, one on the way. My daughter is uh, just had her 20-week ultrasound yesterday. So Wonderful. Got a little, another little boy on the way. And you have a son in plastic surgery. I do, I do, and I'm quite proud of my son. He uh, did his uh, plastic surgery. He went to medical school at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and then uh, is uh, did his plastic surgery residency at uh, University of Wisconsin with uh, Mike Benz, who's president of the association this year. And, uh, and uh, then uh, he did uh, fellowship training at the Cleveland Clinic, is now in practice at, in Madison uh, for the last two and a half uh, plus years uh, in, so private, you've, in private practice. You've all stayed up there then? We all have, yes. Okay. I did an ENT residency uh, before I did my plastic surgery residency, and I met uh, Sherry. She was an audiologist at the Ben Taub Hospital in Houston, Texas which is, of course, the uh, county hospital. And so I asked her out, and uh, we dated for uh, two or three years and, and uh, married in the middle of my plastic surgery residency. You were also uh, otolaryngology o trained. Otolaryngology. So my, uh, my chairman there was Bobby Alford, and then my chair uh, at, uh, in plastic surgery at Indiana University was Jim Bennett. What inspired you to go into plastic surgery if you were otolaryngologist first? I had never wanted to be anything but an otolaryngologist. But about halfway through my ENT residency, uh, I, was, I was single, and so I, I said, you know what, I think I want to do more than just be in private practice. I want to do something different, and I think I want to go into academic medicine. And at that time, just like now, you can't just finish your residency and just start. You have to have some postgraduate training. And that was, this would have been in uh, the early 70s, about when the American Board of Plastic Surgery made the decision, wisely, okay. thankfully, uh, to uh, allow other pathways into plastic surgery. And one of the decisions that they made was that you could be, uh, go through ENT, orthopedics, neurosurgery, urology. Um, in and addition to general surgery, in, of course. In general surgery, of course, uh, in, in addition to general surgery. And so uh, I made application to a number of uh, programs that I wanted to go to an excellent program in plastic surgery just as I was a graduate of what I considered an excellent program in ENT. And so I sent letters to all of the uh, chiefs of uh, 
of uh, places like uh, Vanderbilt and, uh, and uh, Northwestern and Harvard and Miami and so on around the country. Uh, and uh, they all sent me back letters and they said, well, you know, we'll be happy to consider you, but you, after you do your general surgery residency. So my chief, uh, Bobby Alford, in uh, Houston, in ENT, knew Jim Bennett. They had done a fellowship in Galveston. So uh, Bobby Alford called Jim Bennett and said, you know, I've got a guy here that is interested in plastic surgery. And, and uh, uh, Jim Bennett had, uh, had just uh, uh, had a program. Uh, he had a, an opening, possible opening. I went up for the interview and uh, was accepted. Then there was no match or anything at that time. So that would have been in 1976, I finished my ENT and started plastic surgery. So you see momentous change we have in our oh, career yes. and, and the paradigm shifts. T t tell me a little bit about what you've seen that you find so You know, I, I feel so fortunate in, in so many ways. Uh, plastic surgery has been so gratifying to see many of the changes. Um, most of them are, uh, I, was, I, I was fortunate to be in the golden age of plastic surgery, which would have been the late, uh, mid to late 70s mm -hmm. through the 80s, because that was craniofacial surgery, breast surgery, musculocutaneous flaps, uh, free tissue transfer, tissue expansion. Uh, breast reconstruction. Breast reconstruction, uh, mind boggling. Mm -hmm. You know, things that are, uh, in, uh, that are uh, the previous generation never even dreamed of, much yeah. less uh, thought in terms of this really happening. And so uh, when I finished my uh, plastic surgery residency in December of uh, 1978, Bennett made me do two and a half years of plastic surgery, not two years. Okay. In fact, when I started, he said, I'm going to take you, but I've never taken somebody from ENT, okay. so I think you're going to have to do three years of plastic surgery. So I'd been uh, a resident up there for about six months. He called me in one day and he said, well, he said, you know what, I've made a decision. You don't have to do three years, but you do have to do two and a half years. Okay. So that's why, so I started in, so I finished that uh, position and then I started at MD Anderson in uh, uh, January of 1979 and I wore two hats. Uh, the, the first hat was uh, I was an ablative head and neck surgeon which mm -hmm. was the deal that I cut because I wanted to use my surgical skills uh, from a, and I loved head and neck surgery mm -hmm. anyway. Uh, so I was in the department of head and neck surgery but the second thing was they had not had a plastic surgeon on staff for over a year before I, I went. So I was going to be the plastic surgeon, and I was the only plastic surgeon for seven years. Wow. For seven years, until uh, 19, un, until January of 1986, which is when uh, I moved to uh, Milwaukee. But. Uh, I think those were some of the most uh, fruitful and productive years in many ways. Not just from an ablative head and neck standpoint, which is I, I did, I wrote a lot of papers and did, uh, 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 was productive from that standpoint, but I also introduced the musculocutaneous flaps mm -hmm. there. And I remember the very first. Uh, the very first musculocutaneous flap that I did there at MD Anderson, they had never heard of that. Which one did you do? Well, I did a pec flap, okay. and I did a very unusual procedure that I've actually never done since. I did uh, a pec flap, and I did a uh, reconstruction <clears throat> of the base of the tongue <clears throat> for failed base of tongue cancer uh, that had recurred after radiation therapy, mm -hmm. <clears throat> preserving the larynx. So. I did this and I'll, <clears throat> it, was, <clears throat> it was fun, but it was a little nerve wracking because um, you could almost not find <clears throat> a standing room in the operating room when I was doing this mm -hmm. because it was so Because nobody had done it before. Nobody, they'd never seen it before. And I had only seen it presented 
uh, the year before by Steve Arian mm -hmm. at the American Association of Plastic Surgeons. And he had, he, I, and I loved, I thought this was great. And so I did that. And as many, as you know, many plastic surgery procedures we do, you actually, uh, you, you might have seen them or just read about them, but you have a surgical skill set and you know the anatomy and mm -hmm. you just say, okay, I can do this. And you know, that's the great thing about plastic surgery because you and I have both done many operations yeah. we've only read about, and some we haven't even read about. Right. We just thought they might work, and sure enough, they did. Well, you know, and I was taught, I can't remember, <laughs> it was one of Mike's, I've done nine uh, interviews so yes. far. Yes. But, and I was discussing about, that the, if you know the principles of plastic surgery, <clears throat> you'll devise a method. If you know the, it, it, you don't get scared, you don't have to do it so cookbook, you may say something and turn it upside down yeah. Because hey, and, it fits it here better. It's still the same blood spot. I know how to do a skin grab. You, well, you had a set of skills that you added to what you had. You're exactly to right. advance. The, the, and that's you know. And you got a the, crowd to watch you. That's right. And that's the skill set that mm. you try to instill in your residents as you teach them. Right. Uh, you want to give them skills because, as I would say, uh, when I was teaching, uh, talking to medical students or the residents, the operations I I did at the end of my career were only imagined at the ones I was doing at the beginning of the career, and musculocutaneous flaps is a perfect example. When I was there for seven years, I did exclusively musculocutaneous flaps <clears throat> for chest wall reconstruction, for mm -hmm. head and neck reconstruction, that sort of thing. And a lot of my, if you look at my CV, a lot of that is, is reporting of that. And I worked with uh, a guy named Manny Molissanos, who was a wonderful microsurgeon from Herman Hospital, and he would come over and he would do uh, free tissue transfer when it was needed. But in the whole time, seven years I was there, we did like six, yeah. six free tissue transfers. And I can remember saying, David, that this, I said, musculoskeletal flaps, this is the way it is. Free tissue transfer is great for lower extremity or for uh, upper extremity, mm -hmm. but I don't know that there's any future for it in the in the head and neck area, and I have got I've given lectures on that fact. I could not have been more wrong, <laughs> because now, now well, that's I a did, momentous shift right there, yeah, a exactly. paradigm shift. Oh, it's a it, it's a wonderful paradigm shift. You got I'm plenty of vessels in the head and neck area. I'll tell you, <laughs> it's funny because now you know I've been retired for three and a half years, but. At the end, uh, in the latter part of my career, when I was at, uh, you know, up at, uh, in Milwaukee, mm -hmm. when I would do a musculocutaneous flap, there were people in the room because they'd never seen one. Oh, because they were doing free all they were doing was free tissue. I had <laughs> hey, the five. old guys in here doing a muscular. <laughs> That's exactly right. So I had five micro, uh, I had five wonderful microsurgeons on my faculty at MD Anderson. I mean, at, uh, at the medical college. And so they, they did all of that work. And, uh, and, uh, and so they, heart, they didn't do any musculocutaneous flap. I did the first breast reconstruction at MD Anderson. I did, delayed the first immediate breast reconstruction. And I remember I had, I w thought I would go to MD Anderson in 1979 and I would set the world on fire because there were all these breast reconstructions to be done. It was nine months before I did my first breast reconstruction. And uh, because the general surgery faculty mm -hmm. was yeah, very, I, they did not understand. In they fact, were stilted that way. I gave, exactly, and I gave a grand rounds. I, I mean, I gave a lecture to them about breast reconstruction. And I know one of the slides was, uh, because that was before there was PowerPoints and all that. You had to make diazo slides, and I, anyway. There were five. I remember that. You, you did not do breast reconstruction on With, anyone until they had been free of disease for five years. That was sort of the standard of care at that point in time. And uh, so I, I was so proud of myself because I put this, uh, I was using dual projection and all this kind of oh, stuff. Oh, you, you got, you accomplished that. Oh, I couldn't yeah, get no, that that's a, yeah. Well, I did because it sort of broke down in the middle of it. And I, anyway, but I remember one of the, I said, all right, I finished my presentation finally. And one of the general surgeons raised her hand and they, and they said, why would a woman want a breast reconstruction? And there I knew I was up against 
I, I had a hill to climb. And it uh, really worked fine, but it was nine months before I got my first referral, and it was from a junior faculty member, mm -hmm. uh, obviously. But then once we started doing it, and then I had Steve Kroll as my first fellow mm -hmm. at MD Anderson, and that was 1982, and then he brought the tech, he introduced and showed me the technique that he had learned from Bill Little, and then it, it just took off. And yeah. Steve was a wonderful uh, technician, as you know, and <clears throat> it's so awful to lose him years yeah. ago. But uh, so we did the first tram flap there, <clears throat> and uh, and and it was uh, it was a wonderful. Uh, time from a uh, from a clinical standpoint. I'd, it was the golden age. It was the golden age. I had three operating rooms to, and I had yeah. fellows and I had the senior residents from the three yeah. training programs down there at the same time. So it was great during that seven years. But then I got a call uh, to uh, look at uh, being chief of a program, a plastic surgery program at the Medical College of Wisconsin uh, and they said, Dr. Bennett had given your name, us your name, and thought that you may be interested. And I remember saying, now, wh where is this? And I said, well, it's in Milwaukee. And I, I said, now, Milwaukee, uh, is, is, that, is, that in there? is that in Minnesota? <laughs> I, I remember asking a stupid question. Nick, and uh, the Joe Darren, the guy, the guy in the search committee, said, he said, no, no, no. He, he said, no, we're just north of Chicago. I said, oh, okay. So I flew up there literally for a day, mm -hmm. and I saw the potential, and and for expanding and changing a career focus mm -hmm. as opposed to just working with cancer patients, but to actually provide some uh, other leadership and to be Wonderful. an a educator and to a, it's just a career yeah. shift, yes. so to speak. And uh, I had uh, wonderful faculty there. Well, I'll give you a segue because yes. I think you've discussed it. What, what do you think has been the most important innovation in our specialty? Obviously, free tissue transfer and, uh, and breast reconstruction. I think the ways I, I looked at the things that I was able to do at MD Anderson was to do surgical rehabilitation of patients uh, from a... Uh, uh, an aesthetic standpoint, but also from obviously a reconstructive standpoint, because my challenge to the surgeons there, give me a hole, I'll fill it. Mm -hmm. I don't care how big it is, where it's located on the body, and I will figure out a way to fill it. And they gave me some big holes, but I was able to allow them to do a much larger ablative procedure, right. and with musculocutaneous flaps, they could then get on with their chemotherapy and that sort of thing. Right. Um, I developed a uh, protocol for management of extravasation injury, primarily uh, adriamycin, mm -hmm. cytotoxic toxic agents. Is that your greatest professional accomplishment? No. I didn't think so. I no. <laughs> no, I think I that was uh, that was a contribution yes. that I that I made, and uh, uh, being the only plastic surgeon considering the, fa the fact that they now have 25 plastic surgeons at MD Anderson, I always used to kid them and say, when I'd see them at meetings, I'd say, you know what, if you just could have given me a little bit more money for a salary, mm. you know, I could have saved you a whole bunch. Yeah, <laughs> so, right. But that's not the case because now microsurgery, obviously, is the, uh, that's the, bench, uh, the, the benchmark. What do you think the greatest mistake as a specialty we've made? I think... I think uh, politics and pride. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the politics, we're a small specialty. I don't care how big you think we are as a specialty, we are still one of the smallest, maybe not as small as colorectal surgery, but right. pretty close. <laughs> and I think the failure for us to find some common ground so that we can have, be, have a unified uh, uh, specialty, more unified specialty, primarily based on based on pride, and uh, and people bringing uh, baggage to the table that they really don't need okay. to. Uh, I, I think that's that is really a specialty. That's a problem. Yeah. That and I think uh, we are more aligned with um, otolaryngology now than we've ever been. 
uh, primarily because of uh, of what's happening in the cosmetic world with everyone calling themselves Co uh, yeah. co cosmetologists and so on. Yes. So I think that was another thing that we were a little late in coming to the game. And I think perhaps I might have been uh, able to uh, facilitate that in some in some way over over my 35 years in uh, academic plastic surgery. Did you find that you had more ENTs applying to the plastic program because of who? You, because of your, no, oh, okay. <clears throat> not at all, <clears throat> not at all. And I think there are fewer uh, otolaryngologists that are applying, going through plastic surgery now mm -hmm. than there used to be. Um, it's, uh, but it was, it was, a, it was a, there was a big push for that for about 20 years. What, do you have any thoughts about uh, professional disappointments, or do you have any? My biggest professional disappointment was that I did not recognize microsurgery for the, the potential of microsurgery and for me to, to, to learn microsurgery. Obviously, musculocutaneous flaps were the big thing. When I was a resident, I had seen a latissimus flap and I'd seen a, uh, a uh, soleus flap. Those are the only two things I'd seen when, before I went to MD Anderson. And microsurgery was, that was uh, something that's very, very unusual. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't, and I thought the whole future of reconstruction was musculocutaneous flaps. So, and I didn't have anybody to teach me. I think my greatest joy has been an opportunity to be an educator. An educator uh, in every sense of the word. Uh, so my residents, and the, my trainees over the years that I've trained at, uh, at both at Anderson and obviously uh, in 27 years at the medical college has, uh, has really been my greatest joy, but my supreme greatest joy is my son, mm. who- uh, The plastic surgeon. The plastic surgeon who chose, he chose to go to, med to become a physician. I didn't push him to that, and I certainly didn't push him into plastic surgery, and he loves it. And, uh, and now I have the uh, distinct privilege of being able to operate with my son oh, wow. for, for cosmetic cases. That is a cases. joy. And, uh, and so, and he actually calls me up or sends me picture page, what would you do with this? And so Isn't it's really neat. And then he uses my, uh, uh, my suggestions sometimes, and many times he does, but most time mine are the same things that he comes up with. Who do you admire most professionally or personally? Um, I think my mentors. I had three mentors, and I mentioned Bobby Alford, mm -hmm. the chair in, in uh, ENT at Baylor. Uh, Jim Bennett, a wonderful uh, mentor who I was able to honor when I was president of this organization four years ago, and he's still alive and 93 and doing great. <laughs> and then uh, Dick Jesse. Uh, Dick Jesse was the was uh, probably one of the most well known and honored and recognized head and neck surgeons in the world at the time that he accepted me as his as a, wow. he mentored me in head and neck surgery uh, when I first started uh, in, in uh, at MD Anderson and then he died of uh, within about two and a half years he died of hepatitis of, uh, of uh, end-stage liver disease with varices and all that sort of thing. And, uh, but he had, he really, he and the, the other faculty there trained me in, uh, to become the head and, a head and neck surgeon. Okay, yes. I want you to give some words of wisdom to present and future <sighs> residents. You know, let me, or I, I do, Future plastic surgeons. I, for future plastic surgeons, yeah. I think uh, that I, I actually have three short statements. One, is to live every day to its fullest. And uh, do today, uh, don't put off tomorrow to do- Carpe uh, diem. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Don't worry about money. Don't get overly focused on money. Money will come, and so don't think about that. Just, just think about doing an excellent job and being the very, very best that you can be to your patients and to yourself, and maintaining that life balance between home and, uh, and, and work. And 
think in terms of leaving a legacy, mm -hmm. which would actually be my suggestion for uh, those uh, of us that are retired or thinking about retiring, what legacy are you going to leave? You know, you want to, and you know, there's, from a clinical standpoint, there's always somebody that's going to fill the gap for you. Right. Regardless of, you know, there, there are other doctors, but there's Nature no- Nature abhors a vacuum. That's right, that's right. They, they're going to go, that vacuum's going to be filled. But the legacy that you're going to leave is with the relationships with other people, men in particular that you have, obviously your family, mm -hmm. And you need to, uh, I think we all need to be conscious of that and make a conscious effort to leave a legacy of, uh, of relationships and impacting others in a positive sense to help them be the best that they can be, as okay. they say. So wor words of wisdom regarding retirement, although I think you just told me I that. think I just did, <laughs> yeah. yes. And actually I've written a couple of editorials <clears throat> Uh, in uh, in uh, that have been published, and I'm actually gonna, I'm working on another one, uh, just uh, for some of the things that I for, for a journal. My retire yes, for uh, I, they've been published in uh, the Aesthetic Surgery Journal, which is I'm still in a, a, a section editor for that journal, and of course in my I think the other thing is to when you retire you have to be intellectually. Yeah, it has to be something that's yeah. going to stimulate you intellectually, yeah. and uh, and I am uh, uh, privileged to have an encore career. Mm -hmm. These last, uh, I've been retired now three and a half years, and I, I'm a, a site visitor for the ACGME, yeah. and uh, so I travel. I just work every other weekend. I get to tell them the weeks I want to work. Yeah, and so that is really neat to to be exposed to all the 142 specialties and subspecialties of medicine and to learn more about them. So, I'm, uh, so I, I, uh, I, I, I really love that aspect. The final question yes. is, what predictions do you have for plastic surgery in the next quarter century? You know, I think, I think all the operations that can be done have pretty much been described uh, so I think the next wave is the genetic and molecular uh, yeah. uh, aspects of our specialty and fat. I think there is so much potential yeah. in fat, but it is not in describing more, uh, more operations uh, with the amazing things in the anatomic, the things we know anatomically and can be done under the microscope and uh, with uh, the different variations of, of microsurgery, I, I don't know that there's more that can be done. Well, Dr. Larson, it's been David, a pleasure. thank you, you so bet. much. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate it. You bet.